And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A major U.N. report on secret detention policies around the world concludes the practice could reach the threshold of a crime against humanity. An advanced, unedited version of the report was published last week and will be presented to the U.N. Human Rights Council in March. The report examines the vast network of secret prisons connected to the so-called global war on terror. Well, a new investigation by journalist Anand Gopal reveals some harrowing details about America's secret prisons in Afghanistan under both the Bush and Obama administrations. What emerges is a world that goes far beyond the main prison in Bagram and includes disappearances, night raids, hidden detention centers and torture. Gopal interviewed Afghans who were detained and abused at several disclosed and undisclosed sites at U.S. and Afghan military bases across the country. He also reveals the existence of another secret prison on Bagram Air Base that even the Red Cross doesn't have access to. It's dubbed the Black Jail and reportedly is run by U.S. Special Forces. Journalist Anand Gopal is reported from Afghanistan for The Christian Science Monitor and The Wall Street Journal. His latest article, America's Secret Afghan Prisons, appears in the February 15th edition of The Nation magazine and is also available at thenation.com and tomdispatch.org. Anand Gopal joins us now from Austin, Texas, before returning to Afghanistan. Anand, welcome to Democracy Now! Lay out your findings. Well, uh, there's uh, a vast complex network of uh, prisons across uh, Afghanistan, mostly situated on U.S. military bases. Uh, there's at least nine of them that we know about. Um, these are small holding centers that uh, d uh, people are taken to and interrogated. Uh, and then there's also the main prison at Bagram. Um, in addition to that, there's um, even more secretive prisons, uh, some of which we don't even know about, some of which we only have glimpses of. Uh, one is, as you mentioned, the Black Jail, which is also on uh, Bagram and was run by U.S. Special Forces. There's also other uh, prisons that are on other uh, bases, for example, Afghan army bases and uh, Afghan police bases. Can you uh, talk about where you begin your, pay, uh, your piece in the uh, eastern Afghan town of Khos? Talk about the young government employee who simply disappeared. Well, there was a, a young government employee there who one day uh, merely uh, simply vanished, and uh, his family members uh, did everything they could over the course of months to try to find out what happened to him. They uh, appealed to government officials. They um, asked the Taliban. They um, uh, asked the U.S. military, and, and nobody had any idea what had happened to him. And uh, months later, they got received a letter from the Red Cross uh, informing them that. Uh, their loved one had been uh, taken to Bagram, and uh, he didn't know uh, why he was taken or how long he was going to be held. Talk about these night raids where people are picked up and the effect they're having on the Afghan population. Well, night raids are um, U.S. military operations, usually done by special forces uh, that happen at night. They um, occur when uh, U.S. forces enter people's homes in the middle of the night, often to find suspects or, or to look for weapons. Um, very often, um, they'll take people away, and sometimes they even end up killing uh, civilians in the process. And uh, one thing I found going uh, throughout the country and in interviewing people is that th these night raids, uh, which aren't really talked about outside of Afghanistan, the night raids are the most unpopular uh, actions of coalition forces, more so than uh, airstrikes that kill civilians. Um, they're seen as a, a major affront to uh, local culture, um, to the extent where people are actually scared in many places to actually uh, go to sleep at night, because um, they don't know who will burst through the door at night and take away their loved ones. You describe the 19th of November, just a few months ago, at 3.15 in the morning, the loud blast that awoke the villagers of a leafy neighborhood outside Ghazni City, a town of ancient provenance in the uh, country's south. Describe what this team of U.S. soldiers did, whose compound it was, whose house it was. Well, this was a house that was belonging to uh, somebody who was a spokesman for the Ministry of Agriculture. So he was uh, somebody associated with the Afghan government. Uh, U.S. forces came in the night. Um, they burst through the door, and uh, first they killed two people, uh, two bystanders who were civilians, uh, and then they moved on throughout the compounds and. Uh, 
sort of tore the whole place apart. Um, I have pictures uh, of the aftermath, which are uh, in the magazine, and show the sort of devastation um, that was wrought that night. Uh, Dishes were destroyed, um, clothes were thrown, strewn about. Um, they were looking for uh, one person, one family member, who was a computer programmer who had spent time in Kuwait, and uh, they were acting on a tip that this person was uh, associated with, uh, with Al Qaeda. And uh, they took him and uh, one other person away to a, um, a military prison um, some miles away. And what is the reaction of the community? I mean, often you have um, village elders, families going to the Taliban saying, you know, with their connections to them, saying, you know, have you taken this young man? Have you taken this older person? You know, where is he? And only, well, months later or weeks later do they get some kind of note, if they do, that the person is being held by the U.S. forces. Well, in this case, uh, since the, the house belonged to somebody who was associated with the Afghan government, uh, what he did is he um, pulled all the strings he could. He called the Afghan officials, uh, even got the minister involved to try to find out what happened. Because whenever these people are taken in these raids, nobody knows what happens to them. I mean, the family doesn't have any, any sense of where they go or if they'll ever see them again, or even if they're alive or not. Um, so for, for some time, um, they were trying to find out what happened, and we still don't know where um, uh, this person is. Um, and uh, it's assumed that he was taken to Bagram, which is the place where most of the detainees end up. But uh, there hasn't been any confirmation on that. Uh, you quote uh, um, a man saying, I used to go on TV and argue that people should support this government uh, and foreigners, but I was wrong. Why should anyone do so? I don't care if I get fired for saying that, but that's the truth, he says. Yeah, and this is a sentiment that's uh, widespread. Um, again, the, the very act of uh, breaking into people's homes and taking people uh, away to, and to the point where we will never see them again, um, this is something that's really inculcated a lot of fear and hatred amongst uh, the local population. And uh, it's come to the point, especially in the Pashtun areas, where um, there's a lot of locals who feel that uh, they need to be protected not only from the Taliban, but also from uh, U.S. Uh, military operations. Anand Gopal, you write that of the 24 former detainees that you interviewed for the story, 17 said they were abused. What happened to them? Well, this, uh, the abuse ran the gamut from uh, sla being slapped and kicked and punched to, to more extreme cases. Uh, the, one of the more extreme cases, of which I detail in the story, is uh, of one, uh, one person who was uh, essentially waterboarded or um, made to to swallow large amounts of water, and he was uh, hung upside down. He was hung from chains. Uh, he was forced to kneel on a metal bar as it rolled across his shin. Uh, there are other cases of people who've been um, who've had dogs used against them, so dog bites. Uh, there's been accusations of sleep deprivation, uh, where um, interrogators will play very loud music uh, throughout the night and keep the lights on. Um, and also accusations of um, being stripped um, and uh, being uh, held naked in, in public areas or um, held naked out in, outside in very cold weather. Uh, just to uh, um, be exact in the quote uh, of this man uh, who was taken, you say they—you uh, quote him saying, they tied my hands to a pulley and pushed me back and forth as the bar rolled across my shins. I screamed and screamed. They then pushed him to the ground and forced him to swallow 12 bottles of water. And you quote the man saying, two people held my mouth open. They poured water down my throat until my stomach was full and I became unconscious. It was as if someone had inflated me, he says. After he was roused from his torpor, he vomited the water uncontrollably. Can you talk about these— That's right. And, and the Go ahead. So I was going to say that the, the remarkable thing about this is that uh, he was taken to Bagram and then quietly released uh, three or four months later and given a letter of apology saying that um, uh, U.S. authorities realized they had the wrong man. And a, a lot of the people who uh, allege abuse also have these letters um, from U.S. authorities um, basically absol absolving them. And can you talk about how this has or has not changed from President Bush to President Obama, Anand? Well, some of the worst torture um, has uh, subsided in the last—not uh, just under President Obama, but in the last three or four years, some of the worst of it has subsided. But 
um, what's a, a, a deeper shift that's happened is uh, in the early years of the war, this is from 2001 to 2003 or 4, we saw a lot of uh, this sort of thing, um, this sort of uh, really. Um